welcome back to the Futurist Media Podcast. Um, uh, this is another in our companion piece uh, to the Transhumanist Handbook series. And I'm here, um, very lucky to have uh, a, a major contributor to this work and to transhumanism um, in the broadest sense, uh, Natasha Vitamore, uh, uh, to talk about her chapter, uh, The History of Transhumanism. And um, maybe we can get into uh, some of that uh, moving into the present day as well. Natasha, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Ben. I'm pleased to be here. I respect the work that you are doing. Um, many of your ideas are groundbreaking, and I think you represent a, um, a very well thought out uh, critical thinking and visionary thinking aspect of transhumanism. So thank you. Why, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, tran uh, the Transhumanist Party is at a critical stage right now, and I think that the Futurist New Deal uh, was devised uh, to help us get through uh, this tough time, uh, bring people from a lot of different uh, uh, political philosophies together, and I hope, hope that people uh, recognize that. And there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of interesting history there in the history of, of transhumanism. Going, uh, uh, your, your chapter in the Transhumanist Handbook uh, gives us some, some deep background going back some, uh, quite some time, and then also gives us um, uh, information even up to the present day. Uh, 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 tell us a little bit about the, the genesis of this piece. The genesis of the piece is kind of like a, a little track if you have. Um, through looking at what went on in the 1980s and the 1990s and the early 21st century and, and seeing all the pivots that have gone on, um, in direction not only with the advancements in certain technologies, but also the advancements in the mainstream in accepting some of these technologies which were once considered science fiction or um, maybe questionable as far as how they could feasibly affect humanity and society in our future. And so that is certainly worth a level of caution. And so I, I urge uh, a sense of caution about any new ideas, um, but from the stance of being proactive about it, because new ideas always will um, ruffle a few feathers because you're bringing new ideas to the forefront. Now, with that said, in ruffling the feathers, the feathers need to be ruffled. It's very important for all of us to continually question what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how we could do it differently and better. In the business world, we call it fail early and often. Mm -hmm. And when you see that you need to make a change, you pivot, mm -hmm. and you pivot with a bit of guidance. There needs to be a, a level of logic and understanding. And this is where the, the concept of forecasting really plays an important role, to be able to look at varied futures uh, many possibilities for the future, and to look at it through multitasking, multi-tracking. So you take a look at the social elements, the technological elements, the um, societal elements, the economic elements, and also take a look at the uh, not just the economics as far as the finances, but what is driving the, uh, the course of the future. And currently, artificial intelligence is driving the course of the future, and, and that is a given. I remember back in the 1990s, we used to wonder, would it be nanotechnology or, or artificial intelligence that would take hold? And it was 50-50. It was you know, up for grabs. But uh, artificial intelligence took, took the reins, and um, it's moving forward and will bring nanotechnology along with it. So that's exciting. But you asked about um, what was the, the, maybe the purveyor of these ideas, and why did I write this chapter? Uh, largely, I wrote this chapter to set um, some of the, um, a stronger understanding, I should say, of how ideas got started and where they're headed. Now, just because one is around early on doesn't mean that one is uh, not currently involved and helping shape and mold the direction of the movement um, currently and in the future. The, the aim is to keep it going while applying critical thinking, to constantly question where we're at. And this is something that we all should be doing in our everyday lives as well. For example, if you're someone who runs a business, you need to continually question who your uh, demographics are, who your customer is, are you meeting your customer's needs, has your customer's needs changed over time, and if so, you pivot. One company that has been excellent at this is Legos. Lego started out very early on in 1930s, and it was a mom-pa shop 
and it, it changed from its original design to going into plastics, and then it changed from plastics now going into looking at um, designer-wise Legos and um, certainly using um, computer algorithms and building out the Legos, but it's still something that everyone loves to use. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that, so largely it's to take a look at where we came from, where we are today, and where we are headed. Yeah, yes, yes. And that, and that degree of, of flexibility um, in, in terms of, of, of forecasting and in terms of planning for the future is, I think, the most important thing. I was talking uh, to someone uh, just a few days ago, another mm -hmm. candidate, who was a little bit on a different part of the, um, uh, the political compass than I am. But, but we, <laughs> the we, political spectrum. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And, and, uh, but we, we said that the main thing that we have to be thinking about is what works. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in talking about the Futurist New Deal, uh, one of the things that we wanted to discuss, it wasn't the top uh, thing, was uh, the concept that uh, data for all is a public good and should be moving towards being a free good. Um, and But in looking at the, the landscape, uh, rather than uh, focusing on some municipal undertaking or some national undertaking, we, we said that uh, uh, Google and Amazon and the Tesla organization are putting mini satellites up that are, are going to be beaming um, mm -hmm. uh, that data to everyone. So let's let's focus on that rather than uh, so. And I, I, I haven't been blessed uh, with with your perspicacity. And uh, um, uh, so for me, a moment if, of realizing that uh, that all of this was happening was. Was when uh, was when Ray Kurzweil um, mm -hmm. uh, became effectively the CTO of Google, and we said, "Well, mm -hmm. it uh, kind of seems like life extension is a real thing now." <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, and and I mean, it, it was always the subject of interest, but really, uh, thing, things have shifted in, into into overdrive. Um, how do you uh, um, how do you how would you address people uh, who want to think of what's coming in the near in the next decade or so in the 21st century uh, for life extension? for advanced algorithms uh, for the, the transhumanist cause? I think that um, one of the, the core uh, skills to have is to be a really good bullshit detector. Mm. Because with the confluence of all these science and technologies coming together, and we live in an era of entrepreneurship and innovation, where there's angel investors and venture capitalists and government grants looking to seed and fund uh, projects, not all projects have um, a minimal viable product. So having an MVP is really important. So when you're in this area, you have to be able to see what companies are doing well and have a solid board, solid sense of business model, for example, a business strategy, uh, where the money is coming from, what is, you know, the, the financial breakdown of what is the cost of the product or the service, and uh, what are the demographics of it. But again, it's being customer service oriented, and I think that's the bottom line there. So being able to identify what works and what doesn't work, to understand that stem cells has become memetically engineered to be a term that's used very flippantly and um, irregularly. It's almost like you're, we can see stem cells in our toothpaste, stem cells in our clothing, stem cells here and there and everywhere. The bottom line is we're not at the level of stem cell research as which is being prognosticated by many within the uh, medical field and in the um, pharmaceutical field and also in the um, cosmetic field, stem cells in cosmetics for example, skin creams and whatnot, those stem cells are not going to reverse your aging by any stretch of the imagination. Stem cells have only been used um, successfully in um, knee areas, in some um, brain surgery and eye surgery, and that's very, very, very organized and well meticulated for that particular area by expert physicians, surgeons, doctors who understand the chemistry of the stem cells. Also something to be um, considered is that if you do get a stem cell injection, say you leave the country and go to some place where it's, it's offered for a, a reduced price, stem cells can cause, cause cancer. They can cause tumors because when a stem cell goes into the body, it will go to where there is a problem, an illness, a, um, maybe an inflammation and it may not go to the area that you want it to go to. So if it goes to the wrong area, it can cause a tumor. So being a bu good bullshit detector is being able to understand what stem cells are and to be able to identify the hype there. Another area is, um, say, therapies, anti-aging therapies. Uh, take a look at Elizabeth Holmes, for example. 
Um, she made billions of dollars, was extremely wealthy, had a company for a number of years before she was found out, and she was breaking the law. So she's in trial right now. She took money from people claiming to have invented a blood identifier that could do a prick of blood on a finger and put it into this machine, and there was never any machine that was developed. There was a prototype for it, but it never functioned, so there was not a minimal viable product and MVP on it, and it didn't work. So um, that's just, those are just you know, two situations. There are hundreds of thousands of situations. People who go to their dentist for rhinoplasty, for example, uh, people who have uh, laser surgery by someone who is not um, an authentic certified eye doctor going to um, someone who doesn't have the correct certification, the correct um, degree qualifications and knowledge and experience um, can be very damaging. So we're going to see a lot of snake oil salespeople <laughs> this decade and we need to, as transhumanists, be critical thinkers and to be able to identify truth from fact and fantasy from fiction. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the Theranos scandal, and uh, in in uh, in the presentation that I was lucky enough to see uh, from the weekend before last, uh, and uh, yes. it, it got me thinking. Maybe uh, at this time as well, do you think that um, uh, this is a multi-billion-dollar, kind of effectively a Ponzi scheme that blew up? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you think that things like this in the life sciences, do you think they set us back? Uh, do you think that something that, that was that was very high profile on the cover of every uh, uh, weekly news magazine? Um, uh, do you th uh, how do you think that affects perceptions of, of, of uh, life extension technology? Oh, ben, that's an excellent question. Okay, so here let, let's take a look at this. Will the Elizabeth Holm Theranos blood um, scheme set us back in the life extension community? No, I don't think so, and let me explain why. Uh, I see two issues here. Number one, it'll make people more cautious about what they're investing in in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a very good thing. So sometimes when something bad happens, it has a positive outcome. And thank goodness that the angel investors, those investors who are very well known, and including people like Kissinger, I mean, that was crazy, Obama, Clinton, um, you know, some very well-known um, experts in their respective fields will think twice about being influenced by someone who may have a bit of charisma. Okay, the second thing that does concern me, but I don't think it'll set us back, what does concern me is that no one in Silicon Valley that we know of in the life extension community, and we have many friends there, many organizations there, why didn't they talk about this? Why wasn't this written up and talked about, not just within the transhumanist circle, but within, you know, um, the USTP. What about all these other organizations, the Foresight Institute, the Future of Humanity Institute, the Future of Life Institute? I, it goes on and on and on, the different organizations, a group of people who are transhumanists in scope. Why weren't they bringing this out and talking about it and putting it on the table and saying, here is a situation we all need to be aware of. What can we learn from this? And now how not to be um, hide it. So then you wondered, was it hidden because people were embarrassed about it? But nothing should be hidden like that. It should be brought out to be talked about, discussed, and go, how can we eradicate or mitigate this type of bad press? And it really was bad press for, for not just life extension, for any type of entrepreneurial innovation within Silicon Valley, especially by a young woman in, you know, in her early 20s who uh, was um, said to be a genius, and evidently her genius was not in inventing a company, but in fooling. It's the really company. interesting, and, and what I'm enjoying right now about the, the current trending within transhumanism is um, the, um, uh, the scope of diversity. Diversity is, is quintessential to transhumanism. If we take a look at the tenets of transhumanism, it's about inclusivity, diversity, multiplicity, uh, a level of equity in a good sense, uh, you know, with, uh, regarding empathy and abundance for all, or sharing our knowledge with others. And transhumanism um, is uh, focused on critical thinking, and that's so important and endemic to it. It's an innate characteristic that in order to assess the future and to be looking at where we are, where we're headed, and, and preferred futures, different you know, paths that we can take, to apply critical thinking skills to that. 
And another area there is good debating skills and understanding how to be a good, effective debater, which requires knowing your information, not making accusations, not making ad hominem attacks, not um, using fanciful language or hyperbole for effect. But that is uh, reflective of very poor debating. So if you, if, um, you want to argue a situation, uh, what is better for maybe um, climate change or maybe for um, a, um, a way to address um, maybe the New Green Deal or any, any the new transhumanist deal, any of these, these issues, to be able to debate them authentically with a viable set of, of goals and aims within your arguments. That's really important. And not only that, to be able to back it up with evidentiary research. That means not just one source, but several primary sources. And even with that, it's, it's very wise to have conflicting sources so you're not just, you don't come off as a Pollyanna or someone who's just promoting one element or aspect of something. You can show the alternative aspect of it equally um, as much. So um, you can show the, the other aspect of it equally as much so that you can say, well, here my argument is X, Y, and Z. Now let's take a look at this. Um, the uh, the scientific review suggests 99% of, of such and such is um, evidence through such and such. You can say, alternatively, the Encyclopedia of Medical Research in Longevity suggests that it's 50%. So even uh, if um, you have conflicting views, show those views and identify those conflicting views and the resources. Then you come out on top as being a knowledgeable person and that's what a transhumanist is. Not being fooled by information, not being influenced by hyperbole, not being um, a, a dogmatic, stuck in the mud about your beliefs. In fact, my beliefs, my core values have stayed the same throughout my life. There's certain core moral values, but looking at you know ethical reasoning, that has changed over time because not only does our technology and science change over time, our experiences change over time. And may maybe in the past you had a certain view about how to spend money, and then you change your mind once you pay high taxes and have a mortgage and have three children. Your idea or your idealism becomes more real and pragmatic. So I think that. Um, Another area that is really important for transhumanists in the current arena is being able to ask questions. Um, to admit where we you know, don't know the information, get the information, analyze it, discuss it. We need more open discussions about information. So you're um, within the political arena. I have once been within it, and I will in the future at some date, but currently it's, it's not my driving force. Mm -hmm. Education is. But looking at the transhumanist uh, political arena on a global scale, there's so many different views. Mm -hmm. Some are far right, some are far left, some are socialists, some are up, some are down. And I think that that is a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. and. The issue here becomes how can we work together? So instead of being a for or against a proposition, discuss all areas of the proposition or angles of the proposition and lay it on the table and find the most viable uh, reasoning for that proposition. And that's why, I, you mentioned this earlier, I think algorithms could do a very good job in assessing information because they're not emotionally driven. They'll take a look at all the information around and then do an analysis and present it you know, as an output, data output, and then we as humans or transhumans can look through it and say this works, this could work, um, how long would it take to get this to occur, that to occur, et cetera. So I think that um, narrow AI going into a smarter AI uh, machine learning is really going to be helpful in the, in the political arena and determining policies, legislations, and laws that are best for um, all humanity um, within their given geographical locations and governmental locations. Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly interesting subject, uh, this idea that um, advanced algorithms can add a lot more to what uh, the, the, um, the functionality and facility of, of, governing, of governing organizations. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of this demonstration from uh, Google uh, Labs, the Google mm -hmm. Assistant, uh, just uh, uh, just about two years ago, and it was a a, pro a simple product that allowed uh, you to be having a, a digital assistant making calls on your behalf that was indistinguishable from an actual assistant. And uh, what people people were saying at this time and, and today that this kind of product it's it's it, it would provide a free front end of a business for every person on earth. Like right. everyone could be running a small business 
um, using uh, using this uh, enhancement in man hours uh, that would be provided to them, and it's and it would be silly for us not to apply that same thinking uh, to governance uh, when when there's so much that government uh, isn't able to do for a lack of resources, and in that framework that that uh, that's that's completely shifted, and uh, we're having actually a talk on the uh, detonation program, the steel archer program, at six o'clock tonight. Just a few short hours on the subject of al algorithm run uh, uh, technocracy uh, from from the legality and also policy standpoint. A few excellent, yeah, yeah, and, good, and good. Get a little plug in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, so we're kind of out of time. Yes. Um, but I welcome you to come into my class, and I'm going to be oh. instructing. It's on communication, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and um, I teach business and communication and ethics, and I enjoy all those courses. Uh, so. It's very exciting, and I look forward to putting together a transhumanist university so we can help people around the world learn critical thinking, how to ask questions, how to learn, how to pivot in their thinking, and how to create prosperity for all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Natasha. Thank uh, you. You're an inspiration, and I will be at your class with bells on. I will be looking forward to that. Okay. Uh, thank, uh, thank you so much. Thank you.